Good morning and welcome. This is Tevo DRC, and you've reached the DFW Leader Ministry Online Fellowship at onlinefellowship.us. And we're here for the body of Christ, for pastors, leaders, lay people with a call to ministry leadership. And it doesn't mean that you're in a traditional mode. In fact, that's my topic. This is a mini blurb. I'm just going to make it about five minutes or less because it came to my spirit today. And I want to put these things out. I'm going to also add it over on our YouTube, uh, the Abiding Relationship Theology, which is abiding in James 3.17, enduring even under pressure in all relationships. And this is for fearlessness, but for the faith-filled, you must be born again community. And we put it out for your resource and a selah. When I was sitting here with the Lord today, I was just thinking about, are you the phrase, are you a prototype or a stereotype? There's a lot of leadership out there today that has been around for many years and mostly very good and well-intentioned. And there's nothing wrong with using generalities Christian generalities, but if they get into the legalism of forming stereotypes, a religious spirit can settle in and it makes it prone to be accused or mistrusted because they've gotten uh, full of themselves or they've just gotten this mindset, this mind field that there can be no other type except their own preferred in-house ministry version of leadership, of doctrine, of teaching about spiritual warfare, of teaching about uh, government and authority. So the word comes, what are you, a stereotype? Are they enforcing stereotypes? Do you have to be fight the pressure to be in their norm or you're not approved? That's almost like it triggers, not in the leadership, they don't know it, but they're triggering FOMO. FOMO is the new word for fear of missing out and it creates pressure down in the immature, the younger believers with ministry calls, or they think they do. And so then you'll find the peer pressure in the ranks in these types of places around America, other places to curry favor with the leader at the top, bowing and scraping, as it were, inwardly genuflecting people please. It's people please. It's based, related on Fear of man, fear of human, fear of their displeasure, fear of woman brings a snare. And those who put the trust in God will be safe. I'm reminded of the balance of the whole Bible is found in, that means the middle verses of Old Testament and New is found in Psalm 118, 8 and 9. That Psalm 118 is the theme and the theory behind our apostolic college teammate university doctrines for a new day because if you read through every bit of psalm 118 it really chronicles what a real minister who's pioneering a new work male or female will encounter eventually some places more than others different parts of it but anyway psalm 118 verse 8 9 says do not put your confidence in man in a human male or female only put your confidence in God. You can like them, you can love them, you can believe them, and then always watch out just to make sure that you are really keeping your wits about you with everybody. Then Psalm 118 verse 10 says, 9 and 10, it says, do not put your confidence in princes, only put your confidence in God. Those are the crooks of the whole Bible, the crux, not the crooks. And so that means princes, they're the elders, the leaders. That means you can honor them and respect them and show deference to them, respect to leadership. But then you always watch out. You ultimately don't swallow everything everybody says or does or people please. You don't swallow it hook, line, and sinker. That's the word of the day. Also, you can check both groups by their James 317 relationship, quality, real respect over time in ministry. Are they mature? Are they accusers, boasters? Are they genuine, down to earth, and reliable? Do they treat people all with equity? Are they as good with the youth and the young, respecting them as they are with the old? So many ways to evaluate and critique without being a critic. Assess Never assume, but assess without accusing. So if we look at the difference between a stereotype, 
you know, a lot of people are used to getting, they're working the word, they're working this, they're working that, so they want to be efficient with their time. They're tired, so they'll sort of enforce in the group, and they'll be traveling around, even around groups that are kin to each other in their spiritual calling. You'll find this pressure to conform, peer pressure, prophet pressure, pastor pressure, or people pressure, your own pressure, which isn't necessarily God's Holy Spirit. That's why I believe in doing what we just said before, but also checking out what God is saying to you individually, personally, and truly, and then do only what He says. That's really right. That's part of what is called working out your own salvation, not theirs, yours, because ultimately you'll stand before the throne of God when you die, and you will be held accountable for what you chose privately and ministerially. Also, even though we respect them and we love them, we honor them, people are human. They don't know it all. I don't know it all. You better check my doctrine. I like the fact, frankly, that Apostle Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the Bible, didn't want clones. He didn't want to make people into his image. He wanted to make them into the Father, Creator's image. So he said, I'm so glad that the noble Bereans, he called them noble Bereans, who were Jews, picked apart his doctrine to, and what he taught to see if it really lined up with the Bible. And you have my permission to do it here, and we do it with yours. So you can have a whole kind of groups that are out there, crowds of people, and they're very impressed impressive because their size or number or how they do it, or they, they, they're impressed maybe with themselves even more themselves. And you can find there's a lot of peer pressure to conform to the template, to conform to the role model of the house, the leader, to, to follow so that you're like a clone. So we're not for cloning. God didn't make clones. He made sons and daughters, and he made them individually as in Psalm 139, 139 fearfully and wonderfully. So we can handle differences. What ap happens is I find a lot of people are emotionally insecure, deeply insecure. And so if somebody comes along that's younger than they or different from they and they outshine them, that might throw the prophet or the prophetess back because they are shaky. So we're, we're not shaky in that manner. We want you to outshine me, but don't do it as a, as a rivalry or competition or as a threat. Do it because you really have the gift and you're doing it to please God. You're focused on Him, not me. That's how I, I try to operate my life every day. So the opposite of a clone, a spiritual clone in ministry, would be a prototype. Now, not everyone is going to be the, an office minister. You may have similar gifts and act like them or think a bit like them. But unless you really get the call and go into the long process of decades of sifting and being milled repeatedly like Paul or like a prophet in the wilderness like Joseph, then you may not be a real office minister. You might be on their team. You might be understanding of it, but you don't really have the call. You might be better in business or music or something. So this is a generality, and I'm submitting this as your own ability to pick apart as a noble Berean and evaluate, get God to confirm it. So if you have a call to, let's say, birth a work, God has called you, then if you are the head one, you're the apostle of your work, the chief apostle, if it's a movement or chief, you know, the chief apostle of your work, but don't let it go to your head. This is not capital A chief, not capital A and C, chief and A, this is lowercase letters like Paul writes in the book of Ephesians when he talks about evangelist, pastor, prophet, teacher, apostle. They're all servant leaders like himself. Paul didn't believe in big eyes, little U's, elite ministry. In fact, he comes down hard against it in Corinthians 3 and 1, chapters 1 and 3, where he rebukes the division, the divisiveness of celebrity of having fan clubs about some apostles and not the others, because see, if you're on God's team, only Jesus should be famous. So he says to the open rebuke of the Church of Corinthians in chapter 1, he says, listen, don't say I'm for Apollos, and others say I'm for Paul, 
or anybody else. Just say we're for Jesus and let it be Jesus getting all the glory, his name. He also distances himself, it seems. He tries to, in the next few verses, it's sort of maybe he's embarrassed that they are doing that because it's so carnal, so immature. But if you're called to be a prototype, then you're going to start to get a, per you'll have a, you have to have, you'll need to have a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit that's mature and maturing. And you need many years of Bible study, prayer, research, experience, getting wisdom from others, counsel, advice from time to time. That's how I've done it. And there's no set timing. There's no formula for making an office minister, prophet, or pastor. It really is by grace, and it's over God's timing in His season. Pastors may be quicker than apostles, real apostles, and pastors may be released into their call faster than prophets, true prophets. But usually the bigger the office, the bigger the ministry to the Lord, whether it's known or unknown, is usually the longest time to really season a mature prophet is through time and different things. So you'll find the bit, it's like uh, decades. Nobody has it down. Nobody has a formula. So the the pr prototype will feel uneasy. They'll like people. They'll want to go fellowship, be their friend, but they really won't fit in. They'll have this weird, man, I noticed that, you know, maybe they're a bit off or maybe this is how God says differently. Yet they're polite and respectful because they're on God's team and they treasure these things and start keeping notes of what God is speaking. Because see, the prophet and the apostle are based on my own verses for the ministry, which used to have the nonprofit International Fellowship of Foundational Ministries, IFFM, until I had it from 1996 to 2012 when I dropped it as a prophetic act because what was going on and what was not going right in Area Charismatica, and I dropped out of being a charismatic. Though we love the Holy Spirit and all that goes with it, and the people like that, but we just don't want to be part of the legalistic systems of accusing or whatever government which are back under the law. So anyway, so the International Fellowship of Foundational Ministries is a long title, but I got it from the Holy Spirit after a time of visitation and prayer. And it was based on Ephesians 2, who'd have known back then in 1980, 1997 that I'd be quoting and really involved with the book of Ephesians totally as one of my two main books, the New Testament book, Ephesians for me, and then the Old Testament book, Be Isaiah. I'm not, you know, I use different others besides them, but those two really hold a big meaning for me right now for the body of Christ. It's really important because they're deep. But back then I got this call and it was in the spirit and I was led to Ephesians 2, 19 through 21. It says that God builds his church on the foundational teachings of the apostles and the prophets. Those are the office ones, not just ones who walk up and say, I'm one or dream it up. These are true people really called seasoned over time in the process, maybe making barely any progress. It looks like, but God knows their heart. So it says the first church, which we now can easily look back to, had all 12 apostles and they were mentored and called into ministry so they could watch the chief apostles, chief apostle, the prophet of all time, and that's Jesus Christ himself as he went about the area in ministry, under pressure, praying, different things that went up with the tests he had in his life, and he could impart and instruct them, which he did. See him with his family, Mary, and all that. So we find that the New Testament church was built on the the revelation, that means going into the prayer closet, the people with the ministry call, they were men back then, they would go into the ministry prayer closet. Jesus did it first in the Garden of Gethsemane, but then he left. So they were left to figure it out with God. And then Paul comes along and they had apostles who went with prayer and fasting, much prayer and much fasting, because there was no 
media to learn from, no YouTube, no written Bible except the Torah, the law, and they were getting fresh revelation. Did you know that even though there is the word prophet in the Old Testament, that it's really different from the prophet of the New Testament, which is modeled after Christ, much more cheery. You can read that later in Hebrews 1 and 2. But there's no such word as apostle in the Old Testament. An apostle, because I've studied this a long time, an apostle is like a person who's called and commissioned to found a work, whether it's a church, a business, a TV ministry, you know, a TV station or media, whatever it is. But we're talking fellowships. So the first 12 apostles minus Judas and Paul, excuse me, put in Matthias, then comes Paul. We found they're all sent to build the church, the church made up of different kinds of parts of different kinds of people, different colors that couldn't meet in one building, so they fellowshiped house to house, which should be available today, except legalism and criticism and background of the law teaching makes it like forbidden that it's some sin to fellowship with the saints outside your own denomination, your own kind, and your own color. So I think a lot of things are back under the law more than we ever realize. Um, The thing is, when you're a prototype, then you're going to have to be the maverick for a while. Maybe a long time, maybe forever. Everybody's different. So you got to go to God and please Him first. That's why it's so important to not fear other people, their opinions, their judgments, their accusation, their gossip. And so there is the scripture for that. Fear of man, fear of human, brings a snare. Proverbs twenty nine twenty five. Better know that one. Another one is the role model of someone like Jeremiah the prophet. Don't say you're too young, and then God can use you and come and rescue you. He'll need to during different seasons of imprisonment or whatever you're going through. And I like the scripture that says Jeremiah was in prison, locked up, and he couldn't get out. There was no way for him, but the Holy Spirit could get in. And he says to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 33, 3, For him, I want you to call unto me, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things you know not of. So he did it, and somehow he got out. So the idea is this is one of the verses I believe is a good, healthy jump start verse for your progress, for your call, your hope. And you don't have to see anything visible or earth-shaking for a while. Just know that he's doing it. Put your faith in that, that he will and he wants to. And that's what I did back when I was in maybe a junior in in high school. I was just experimenting at 17 years old, made Jesus Lord, and wanted to know what would really happen if I did that. I didn't see all this until the last many years, and it took a lot of work and a lot of struggle and a lot of harvest and a lot of pain, really, to get here, but just to keep on with God as if He's the only one's opinion who matters. Some people left, some people stuck, stuck by, and some people didn't, and that's just part of the turf, because my theory, my thought, were only passing through. You do your best, and then it's up to the other people to choose their choices. So a prototype is going to have to be a colonist going to a foreign nation. In other words, you don't go to a foreign nation. You go to wherever God says, but many times the climate, the atmosphere, the people you meet may not be exactly the most friendly or hospitable or your kind. I think of when the colonists came over, John Smith and the Mayf- you know, all the different ones in Jamestown. I was from the East Coast. So we always went to Jamestown and Williamsburg. But they came over. They were commissioned by the king of England and they came over and they had to clear the land. So when you go, you ask the Lord, if you were the head one, if you were being sent like the chief of your work, then you are the chief You're and you're married and you're the one that gets the download from the Lord originally. You're the head apostle. He's the upper. If it's a man that gets it, which has been traditionally so till now, most of the time, you'll find that the man is the chief apostle and the wife is on the team. So even though I would be, if I get married again, when I get married, whenever that is, if I would be still, the, I would not be the pastor's wife. I'd be the senior overseer. Now, 
to some of you who are very shallow and immature and quick to judge, that doesn't mean that it's this great title or that I really care about it. I'm just telling people because I know this field is my field and this can help people who are stumbling around with all the stuff because we want to bring in the harvest for the Lord. So you go and you are, you know, if you're called and you are sent, an apostle is, a true apostle office is a sent messenger. So either you're sent or not sent. And then the next teaching is if you're sent, and you go and you follow God and you land there, wherever it is, whatever part of the earth, nearby, far away. You may not, once you get there, you may find that it's not exactly welcoming, that you may be sent, chosen and sent and true, but they're not receptive. They don't receive you. And I found that certain times. So that's when you and the Holy Spirit, just like the first church, have to go in there and plug away with prayer and fasting, Bible study, communion, trying to get fellowship, wisdom, and comments from people who've done this before, maybe, as the Lord leads you, not as a recipe, but just as a suggestion, a tip for when God says, if God says. So it takes time, and there is a progress, and you'll probably get a degree, your PhD, at least one, pretty hard days. But because you know you're passing through, you know the you have the oil of joy and gladness, the fruits of the Spirit. You can praise and worship. You know how to get out of that. Then you can go to God and find good company and have fun. It in the oil. I mean, every day with God has been something amazing, no matter how big, how slow, how fast, how bad, how tragic, how good. It's always, I, I really honor God because He's kept me really positive and very joyful and something to look something fun every day with God even though other people may be really nasty so it's I mean God is good so he will bring you through like Paul the idea is that because of the teaching out there today there might be really rigid views of apostle rigid views of prophet of office now the off back to let's get back to Ephesians 2 1 Ephesians 2, 19 and 21, it says God builds his church on the revelation. That means the ideas and Holy Spirit downloads that the office oracles, the prophets and the apostles go into God, get the idea, the download from God, the instruction, and they come out and share the plan with the team, which is the apostolic team, prophetic team, church building team, whatever. It says that they are the crux because they have the next move in mind. Whatever God is planning, He will reveal it. It has to be, you know, one victory, time, and all the attack, and everything else, male or female. However, it says that the chief cornerstone is Christ. That is the key. That's why you're a Christian. You know it's about Him, not about you. It's not about you. It's more about Him, all about Him only for him and that's why we do it that's why i teach and that's why i really don't focus on big offerings and i have not because of the lay of the land the lay of the land is so polluted with weirdness about money the relationship with money and i came from a low-key baptist pastor who is a christian first baptist second and i just saw you know it is the love of money that's the root of all evil because money speaks. There's a relationship with money that can be ruinous and hellish and cause criticism, division, divorce, family feuds, you name it. There could be politics with money. And I, and over here in abiding relationship theology field, which is mine, James 3.17, at all times with God's help, it's the relationship with money that appears to be the root of all evil in the earth, in the earth. Whether you got it, if you got it, you could get pride about it if, and affect people with relationships or use people to get their money or cuss people out because you don't have enough money or break somebody's neck because you're in a fight about stuff. Money and stuff and possessions and mammon are the same. So that's what we're really careful. But the idea is that 
you know, God does, it's not the money, it's the attitude about the money. And I believe that inside your heart is the secret of how much to have, how big to grow it. It's really between you and God, not me. I have an MYOB, mind your own business policy. I say whatever God tells you in between your own ears, your two own ears, and what God says in a clean conscience is okay. And the other okay to filter it through, it's not based on, it's not because of lust, covetousness, greed, or materialism. If it fits that criteria and it's from God, go for it. Choose whom ye may serve. And it, that pertains to your car you drive, your house, your possessions, blah, blah, blah. So back on track. If you're a prototype, when you are the, if you're called and are a prototype, it's just like these many people that are out here everywhere that are so creative and they feel like weird. I know I felt weird. Once you get in with God, it takes a lot of, minimizes the weirdness. Though you can, you'll know if you are a prophet, you'll perceive the attitudes, actions, and mood swings of the people. And you'll know that you're either, you know, they're, they're superior or they're not exactly friendly or that they are easily spooked or things like that. But the idea is that everybody's got their call and not to compete or not to have FOMO, fear of missing out, because the Bible teaches us one of my favorite lifelong scriptures for 30 years, at least more than that. He or she who compares himself with another is not wise. So I don't look at your ministry. One thing, you know, I like different ministries. I like to, I would like to listen to a few more, but I know that if I listen, like for instance, Joyce Myers. One time I went to see Joyce Myers years ago, but everybody was like following Joyce Myers. And I realized, you know what? I have my own ministry. I don't want to be her carbon copy. And I might accidentally, mistakenly get some of her principles or use some of her stuff. So I try to really, I don't listen to certain ones because I like them, but I just don't want to, I want them to have their field. I have to be my field because I'm, I'm called like an apostle, prophet, visionary to hear God with fresh manna. Fill in the gaps. Mine is not, com and see, I don't compete. I don't feel in competition, even though others might put pressure on me like they're competitive. I've had that happen. Envy and rivalry. Oh my gosh, that's one of the worst things. Sick in the body of Christ, in ministry. I purposely treasure the verse, he or she compares himself with another is not wise. My plan is to be wise. So what I've done is I say, I will listen to ones that I know that I'm sent to listen to, but I don't want to get it. I don't want to trade on anybody's stuff, you know, because some people are, they have their turf. I have my own field. I'm a different kind of person. So that could be male or female because I listen to all. I don't listen usually to women more than, I listen to men mostly because that's who's out there. There's certain ones I do and I love the way different ones teach like healing and all that but anyway everybody's got to be on their turf and some turf is not my turf I deal with the Holy Spirit the tongue talkers and I can talk on that and act like you know get in there and 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 minister and I can also hang with the Catholics I can hang with the Methodists the Baptists the all the different colors Vietnamese Assembly of God Church of God in Christ Missionary Baptists vineyard. I can hang with them because I've studied them, been around them, and I really like a lot of what they do and their worship. And I know they're spirit-led. So I just say, pick out what's hay from everybody. Throw out what's stubble from anybody and everybody, anywhere, including me. And then you hear God and make your own doctrine. That's another thing. When we entered into the area of cloning humans, it seems like the spirit but in the church all this high and mighty size education started to roll in at the grassroots and there was this peer pressure at the lower you know the middle class down to conform to the local prophet the local apostle the local tv minister but the tv minister themselves i don't think any one of them know that or went to do that it just happened because we're human i like a lot of the people I like a lot of what I hear on TV. I've always been a noble Berean. I'm sorry. I was raised 
to listen for the inward witness of the Holy Spirit and being led by the Spirit before I even heard of anybody t- talking in tongues. My parents just did it as Baptist and as my mother, a former Presbyterian, her mother did it. So it was just basically that's how you live your life. It's common sense and protection and healthy as a believer, a Christian. We were always Christians first. Denomination is just a little whatever you happen to be sent to one. I've been a Presbyterian. I was one with, with that was for a while I was a Baptist again. But I'm really more happy than I've ever been pioneering our own work and it is onlinefellowship.us in a ministry to ministers trying to get rid of the legalism accusation in ministry and not back under the law and be equal opportunity excuse me <coughs> equal opportunity real respect male or female black or white asian or hispanic so we look at things with criteria the criteria is it is we want an ease sent by god in the glory there's an ease but we don't we know it's not going to be all that easy. It's not going to be always fun. So we just talk, t- chalk it up to, you know, God's with us. He'll get us through. And that's how I do it. But the lay of the land is open. I really believe the land is open and it's not hopeless. I think you just got to turn off the TV more, all the video games. Don't believe the evil report. What mama sitting over there, poor me. The devil's taking this world down in the handbasket, all those sinners. That's what bugs me. The poor me Christian victims that believe the evil report, they think the sinner's fault when they haven't even gone and repented themselves. Like it says in the Old and the New Testament, let judgment, self-judgment begin at the house of God at each one of the houses. Pastors, apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, parents, all of us, you and me, singles too. Let's go for it and do it. Because it says, and the precept still applies of 2 Corinthians 7.14, which I used to hear in the 20 years ago. You don't ever hear it now. About pastors and leaders and God's people repenting. They don't, have, they don't believe he will. I don't think they believe this now, but I believe it. So do it where you are. I do it where I am. And at least a little bit of our land will be healed. And then spread the word. 2 Corinthians 7.14, 2 Chronicles 7.14, the Old Testament says, if, and it's conditional, if the people, God's people who are called by my name, his name, shall humble themselves, this is a relationship with himself, with each other, with God, if they humble themselves and seek my face, says the Lord, and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven and heal their land. Let me ask you, is our land being healed? Do you think it looks like it's healed in this nation? Oh, I think we got some work to do. One of the things is, I'm not going to finger point it. I've never lambasted any non-Christian, any non-believer. I've never been a fault finder of the person who's fallen away. I've never been a fault finder of the one who's from another faith, another belief in my life. Because I know it's not, there is, they have to figure out who Jesus is if they want him but they can't if the Christians are chaotic dysfunctional blame shifting and just not living the true deal they're back under the law or they get hysterical if they see somebody from another faith and start to Bible beat down or if they're shocked easily and when they see somebody from the homosexual community come up and start beating them down because they have bias and they don't see these people as humans made in God's image that just happen to have a different theology and maybe they were raped by the Christian that said they were a Christian or not. I'm sorry that was pretty strong and maybe horrifying to some of you. I don't, didn't mean to do that but that's the when I met had, had that happen the Catholic transcriber, formerly Catholic and I shared this recently but I'll say it again. He came to answer an ad in the paper. I thought it was a woman answering the paper. It didn't matter but I, a man showed up and he turned out to be homosexual, gay So I wanted him to know as a Christian that he wouldn't be in the ministry, but he would be a transcriber and would he be comfortable with what I was saying because he'd be writing it, editing it. So I said, are you a Christian? He said, well, I used to be. Well, that got my attention. I said, well, really? What happened? So he said, well, I used to live way up north, not Texas. I used to live, not Virginia, way up north. And I was a 
uh, my father was real wealthy, my parents were wealthy, and big donors to the Catholic Church. And I went to Catholic private school. Well, when I was 13, the priest started to rape me. And they raped me for four years. And when I finally told my father, the father started to rape him. So those two are the Christians that he knew. That's the Christians that he knew. And here I am. And there's some more after he got to the DFW area that ripped him off, that left tracks that were unkind, that that stole their money from their dream house. And they said, oh, I'm going to pray for you. That type of pitiful example. So I thought, this guy's got a real reason. And this man had studied the Bible and said there are 300. This is what he said. I loved it. I laughed. I interviewed him for my show. He said, you know what? The Bible teaches us that there are 333 verses that warn you against the heterosexual and only nine that warn against you from the warn you against the homosexual. <laughs> See, I loved it. You know, I liked him and respect him because he wasn't lukewarm, hot or cold. He is not lukewarm. He was not ashamed of his beliefs. I loved it. I like that. So then he said, he told me about the sins of Sodom. You need to Google the Ezekiel sins of Sodom and see that it will make your toes curl from the fact that the church is living is is like the sins of Sodom in so many ways. So the idea is you got to hear God. I'm not being critical of you, really, but I think some of us are just narrow-minded. or Maybe we haven't been around or we've gotten fed from books and TV and media and fear or granny who is anti-everybody and a deep southerner, you know, to boot. So let's just go out and try to really get it through the eyes of really being real, respecting everybody because they're made in the office of the human like everybody, president, past president, next president, me, you, black, white, brown, you name it. No matter what their identity or their choices, they are still human. And that is, to me, people who've been hurt, sexually abused, persecuted, reviled, Bible beat down, put down, autocratic, dominated, they will have their extra perceiver, discerner skills operating when they meet anybody and they will know that you are projecting accusation if you are suspicious, demeaning, disrespectful, and they will chalk it up to that's what a Jesus follower is like. And that's why we're getting bad names in the you must be born again community. That's why white and Christian, born again Christian, is getting the same, the same meaning on media as and in the public now different places a lot of places if you say you're a born-again Christian that means hate speech that means bigot racist so I'm I'm talking to you I'm talking to all of you who are born-again Christians you need to know this is out here that is my turf been my turf all my life front lines nobody knows my you know front lines out in the, what should be salt of the earth grassroots and I'm submitting it respectfully even though I get a little I get passionate I get zeal for the father's house because I think you know all you Christians you're already saved you know you're where you're going to go but all these people are confused and hurt and they may not make it unless they really meet Jesus the right one not some white Jesus or Hollywood Jesus or Bible beat down artist Jesus or holding placards and cursing out and blaming and reviling people at their funerals that Jesus I mean awful he's not a homophobic Jesus he's not a whatever hate speak Jesus so the idea is it's about relationships theology not rules and finger pointing that's the message that is the message so we have our YouTube we have our relationship org, and all it means please spread it around teach it now at every level. All it means is that read Jesus' life when he was walking the earth in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when he was in area ministry, when he was the head, senior, everything, and when he had relationships that were with the poor, the fallen, his mother Mary, personal relationships, the Sadducees, when he was under attack, all these things, and then just act and react like Jesus, and you got it. The next part is, why did God come to earth? Jesus came to earth to save us all from sin and death and 
fear and also to give us a place forever in his family up in heaven relationships however we have to say that a lot of people are not focusing on the fact that he came to make us a community or that we are to live the life that is being led by the spirit in a relationship with him right now that we can have it one of the perks one of the god-given perks for inviting jesus here's how it happens you ask jesus into your heart as savior and believe he's raised from the dead and then you're born again and you study about him you know heaven's your home you go out to learn how you can communicate with him day to day well he gives you a deposit small deposit of the holy spirit to everybody who invites him in and that after time can be sort of like an inward witness of a gps to help you get decisions ideas you know little things not a real gps but similar gives you a guidance balanced by the bible good teaching faithful and mature but then it can also give you the seven the seven spirits of god like jesus over in isaiah 11 2 the spirit of might counsel power spirit of the fear of the lord the spirit of the lord all those you can look at like jesus had when he walked the earth the christ it's like the book of acts without tongues and you can have that too book of acts with tongues so all these things are there helping guiding empowering next thing is when you need more help in the area of self-control self-government temperance that's one really wonderful thing about the Holy Spirit because he's part of the gifts of the Spirit it can help you with inner discipline self-control young or old it could help you also if you pray in tongues it helps you with revelation and guidance it helps me as well as refreshing but the ideas we're not being taught by that we're being led by our minds our passions our Old Testament law rules and media and TV we need to be led now by the inward witness knowing how that operates not back under the law with freedom but not licentiousness it uses relationships it has no fear of the Lord so that's when we point that out as well so if you're going to be a maverick embrace it God is using eclectic why because if we don't know God but we can only guess from the father and his creation how eclectic he really is to have you there and me and all the different kinds and styles on this earth he likes different he doesn't want clones he wants pastors who are unique but and acting holy but not self-righteous not goofy or flaky but still embodying that revelation of cutting edge or revelation of life and power and being free from sin that only he can give and display it in vocabulary that he and you understand that to reach this unreached generation so there are many reasons that we talk about the lord life with him the relationship with the father through jesus christ the holy spirit and enjoying our day but also working out our own salvation with each other in a relationship form ephesians 4 meekness and lowliness and long suffering well i gotta go we're gonna say that if we finish up here it was not a mini blurb like i promised but i hope you can understand uh share this please network around relationship abiding relationship theology please there is another relationship theology that i uncovered when i googled to get this domain for relationship theology and it is called that we are abiding james 317 relationship theology and just like joyce myers i didn't read their stuff because i didn't want to take their stuff by mistake god is good his mercy endures be the unique you in all you can be with god's help God bless you. This is Tavo D'Arcy. He loves you. Bye-bye.